Last year, with little more than two lamps and a couple blocks of wood to act as a camera stand, I reviewed the RG350. That device wasn't without its own glaring design flaws, but there's no denying the fact that Ambernic went on to reach levels of success that other Chinese companies can only dream of. To those out there that either sat out or bought the original, Ambernic hopes to recreate that magic again with an all-metal case, redesigned control layout, and a 480p screen. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and today I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the new RG350M. The 350M comes with a 1GHz CPU, 512MB of RAM, 16GB of storage, a 2500mAh battery, and a 3.5-inch 480p screen. The most noticeable change outside of the new layout is the aluminum alloy case. This isn't the first time that we've seen a retro handheld get the metal makeover, but it's the first time that we've seen one with the level of polish that went into this assembly. It's also the first time where the manufacturer was directly responsible for putting out the product themselves, as the prior cases for the 350 and the 350H were all put out by individuals in the community. Most of the device is exactly the same as the one that came before it, but there are some key things that we gain, like a pocket-friendly profile, and some other things that you should take into consideration before buying one for yourself. I want to start off first by comparing the layout and build between the 350 and the 350M. The first difference is a minor one, but the start and select buttons are slightly longer than they were on the first device. For whatever reason, the D-pad lost some of the texture that it had on the surface in the original unit, this D-pad now has large arrows on each end, but it doesn't feel the same as it did on the first unit. The left analog stick and the D-pad have been swapped, and both of these analog sticks are now made using a completely different component. It's worth mentioning that both sticks can click, but that's not really useful in this system. I found this next thing to be a little strange, but the ABXY keys are slightly shorter than they were on the original device, and I'm still on the fence over whether or not I think this is a good thing. The MVP of this entire redesign on the front face has to be the recessed area for the analog sticks, which eliminates the awkward feeling of hitting the joystick whenever you press the B button. Here's a quick profile shot of those buttons. Hopefully you can see from this view how the buttons have changed between the two models. Everything on the top still feels the same. The shoulder keys feel identical. We still have dual USB ports with one acting as an OTG port and the other acting as a USB or power port. We still have a headphone jack. And most importantly, we still have an HDMI out port that does absolutely nothing. That's probably one of the most annoying things about both of these devices. I gave the original RG350 a lot of credit for having this port because I really wanted to hook this thing up to a TV to play games. Back then, everyone at the company made it sound like an HDMI driver release was right around the corner. But nothing ever happened, and this thing is essentially snake oil. The port does work, and you can see that for yourself in some Chinese YouTube videos, but there's too much nonsense surrounding why it hasn't been released yet. I don't have permission to speak about this, so I won't go into any more depth, but suffice to say, there are people with 350s with working HDMI running the code that hasn't been released yet for whatever reason. The bottom of the device has been changed for the better, as both TF card slots can now be accessed without having to open up the device in the same way that you can on the Play Go. The reset button has been moved over to the center, and the power button is now located on the right side of the device. It's also worth pointing out that these changes have made it possible to stand the device up on its own. Both the left and right sides of the device now feature low-profile buttons that make it easier to access these on the fly without impacting your play. The backplate of the 350M received a much needed upgrade to its grip with two rubber pads. The original device doesn't really have enough texture on the backplate to stop it from slipping in your hands, but this small change should be enough to keep the 350M from sliding around. The last thing that I want to mention here is the heat. I don't typically talk about heat unless it's noticeable, and for the most part, it never really is with these low-power Chinese handhelds, but I do notice that the backplate on this can get a little, and I can't emphasize this enough, a little warm to the touch with max brightness running PS1 games. All of this comes in a package that doesn't feel too dissimilar from the base device, but the added distribution of weight feels very nice in the hand, especially after long gaming sessions. Now, I already own another metal device, and I do like the aesthetics of the 350H more than the 350M, but given that the 350H is no longer available, the 350M is the next best thing. 
I also want to do a quick shout out to the modding community of the original 350 that tried to fix some of what this device fixes. If you have an original RG350, there are low profile analog sticks that you can buy to achieve what you see in this product if you don't really want to fork out extra money for the metal shell. And quickly before moving on, I tested all of the buttons and the screen to make sure there were no input or screen tearing problems on this device. The final thing that changed on this unit is the 480p screen, which also happens to be one of the biggest caveats of this product. Whenever I use one of these devices in isolation, I never pick up on stuff that I notice when I switch to something else. The first thing that I saw while I was filming this video was the fact that the IPS panel in the 350M isn't properly white balanced, so you will see slightly more orange tints to some of your games when compared to a standard phone or the original 350 for that matter. It's one of those things that once you see it, you can't ever go back to not seeing it. On the screen, you can see the same game running on the Retroid Pocket, which also has a 480p screen. I didn't match the brightness between these two devices in this clip because the Retroid has a much higher brightness value than the 350M, but you should be able to see what I'm talking about by looking at the whites on the mountain and the color of the pages. Here's another clip using the Legend of Zelda. Again, this isn't matched for brightness, but you can see what I'm talking about if you look at the bed and the walls in this scene. These two are actually brightness balanced, but the difference is harder to see over a video, but the difference is there in person. The new screen also comes with some wonky scaling and filtering settings that don't seem to be fully fleshed out yet. The first one is found in any emulator where hardware scaling has been set. You can change the aspect ratio by pressing power and the A button. The second one is more annoying to use. Pressing volume up or down will go through what the manual describes as sharpening settings. Some games look really nice with this setting set to the lowest value, but others are literally unplayable due to massive amounts of aliasing on screen. It's also super annoying to even find out what your current value is set to since there's no indicator at all in the applications. What this means is that I always end up going all the way down to a value of zero before I try climbing up again to find something that I want to test out. This may very well be improved in the future, but I'm not going to take that as a given given everything that's happened with the original RG350. The next thing isn't really easy to reproduce all of the time, but sometimes you can run into some graphical glitches when you have your scaler set to hardware. This is the main reason why I don't even bother using the hardware scaler at all and I opt for the second option. Beyond this, the hardware scaler jumps through multiple different resolutions in one game if the game happens to support different resolutions. But the jumps are jarring, and they are only present when you use this new hardware scaling option. Now let's take a look at the inside of the device. You will need an Allen key in order to open this thing up, but you probably will never need to get inside here. Someone that has more experience with CNC machines can comment below, but I found it very interesting that you can see the shapes from the front holes in this back plate. Now that it's open, we can see some of the changes that went into this new board. The two analog assemblies are smaller than they are in the RG350, and the pieces themselves are not interchangeable between the two devices. Everything else here is pretty much what you'd expect to see in a product revision. If we compare this to the original device, you can see that the 350M doesn't have any stray wires soldered to the board for the rumble and for the dual speakers, opting instead to use a standard plug option for both of these. This should mean that people won't accidentally break their speakers like they could on the RG350 when they opened it up. The tactile switches have also been changed, interestingly enough to the same style that are used on the Play Go. These switches sit lower and are better reinforced, so you shouldn't have any problems with these breaking off the board, which was possible on the original unit if you weren't careful with your disassembly. Before we move on, here's an audio recording of the speakers at half volume. Now let's finish off with some emulation tests. The 350M maintains all of the performance that you get from the original device, and you should consider what you get here to be all that you'll ever get. The 350 will most likely never see any development into N64 or PSP, so you'll be locked at up to GBA and PS1 for the foreseeable future. You'll still get great performance with Genesis and Sega CD, along with SNES and GBA. GBA performance may increase as time goes on, but those improvements are probably going to be centered around fixing bugs in specific games. The system already handles GBA better than most other Chinese handhelds on the market. 
PlayStation 1 is very good on this device, up to Tekken 3 and Bloody Roar 2, but we finally have everything we need for an authentic DualShock experience for the few cases where it's used. I will just say with the firmware that this device shipped with, Ape Escape was not configured to take advantage of L3 and R3, and that's really to be expected since those buttons are essentially useless on this device. You may have noticed that I haven't talked about battery life yet, and that's one of the biggest disappointments of the 350M. I wasn't really expecting that Ambernic would keep the 2500 mAh battery in this newer model, which makes about as much sense as upgrading the screen to a 480p IPS when almost nothing can take advantage of it. I just want to note that if this number ever changes in the foreseeable future with some firmware update, I will leave it inside the pinned comment. I did two full battery drains with this device at maximum brightness sitting in a Super Nintendo title screen and it died after a little more than four hours. Making matters worse, it can take just as long for the red charging indicator light to disappear, signaling to you that the unit is completely charged. Obviously the screen upgrade wasn't going to be free, but there's no way it was worth losing over an hour of battery life just to see slightly smaller pixels on your screen. There may very well be some ports in the future that take advantage of this higher resolution, but as it stands today for the product that is currently on sale, the only thing that uses the 480p resolution are a few PS1 title screens, and that's it. The rest is just a battery drain. Anyway, my name is Taki, and I've been your host on this review. If you like what you saw here and you want to help support future reviews, please consider leaving a like below and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you have any questions about this device at all, you can leave a comment below and I'll make sure to get back to you. Until next time, Taki out.